Hello, and welcome to another episode of Heaven Will Be Mine. Today we're going back to see Saturn again, uh, with our mission 400mm Kiss. Sounds nice. Memorial Foundation deploys a certain sniper to stop escape and resupply routes to the, to the resting Celestial Mechanics fleet. All Saturn needs to do is stay out of trouble. But what's the chance of that? Launch. Guard duty in Olympus City. Command is worried the Celestial Mechanics unit might try to escape while the fleet is launching, using the cityscape as cover. Then they've just given up on catching them on Ares, if their only hope is them being that stupid. It's a ruined husk, and even Cradle's Graces isn't clinging to it. Like they even cling like they cling to even the faintest sign of life on Mars. Excuse me, Ares. Well, it's boring, pointless work that no one wants to do, and it's gotta make me wonder if someone's actually mad at me. You let the prototype escape Lunaterra, and the most generous assumption is incompetence, which from you they have a hard time buying. That's not fair, I'm plenty incompetent. They should know that by now. You are only incompetent in the ways you wish to be. That's that's a motivating thing to put on your to put in your Facebook. That's an awfully profound way to call me lazy. If you were simply lazy, you wouldn't go out of your way to find so much trouble to get in. And that's the reason why this assignment is so disastrous as a punishment. Boring you is dangerous. I learned that very early on in your career. There's no way to make you sit still. Oh, maybe I'll try it this time. There's this good sniper spot with a view of the whole city. I won't move from there. Why does it sound less like you're promising to behave, and more like you're going to brag about how much trouble you can get in without even moving? Either way, they're sure to put me back on the front, right? I mean, again, I'm going to stick with Betrayal, because I'm increasingly uninterested in the Memorial Foundation getting what they want. Opening futures, closing pasts. Oh, so I guess each faction might have a different thing. The balance shifts, because Saturn moved, and Lunaterra couldn't. Got you. She does. Saturn is as already... She does. Saturn is as good as already down. But so is Lunaterra. Got you too. Pure spite got Saturn this far, and it will get her even farther. She takes aim and fires. Lunaterra, perfectly still for the perfect shot, is perfectly unable to get out of the way in time. Saturn's string of pearls is laid out flat on her back, creaking and twitching, and Lunaterra's Mercurium falls from her sniper spot like a burning star. Lunaterra wakes up first, but her flight unit is shot. It's hard, to hide a sh it's hard to hide a ship that can't fly in a city, but the Mercurium is full of unfair tricks. Shooting her down is just the beginning. You have to catch her next. That's alright with Saturn. She's at her best when everyone is in the dirt. When she wakes up, she's ready. She might be in worse shape than Lunaterra, but worst shape is her best. String of pearls skirts along the half-constructed city with the shape of ruins and the pristine finish of plastic toys still in their boxes, looking for the hole Lunaterra is nestled in and dodging her shots of protest. Reboot took longer than I thought, but ready or not, here I come. Hey, hey, come out, come out, come out, come out, come out. You almost got me that last time you poked your head out to shoot. Try again. Aw, oh, come on. I'm not babbling to trick you or anything. I'm just having a great time here. I'd love it if you stop making me feel like I'm just talking to myself. I can hear you just fine, Saturn. 
What? This isn't exciting enough? I guess that's why you're the ace pilot, LT. I need to have you on the ropes to taunt you and dodge at the same time. An ear-splitting crash, impossible to tell which direction the shot came from. The cover around Saturn explodes. I'm an ace because I keep my priorities straight. That's not what I've heard. What have you heard? That keeping your priorities straight is the thing you're the worst at. That it pretty much that it is pretty much your most obvious weak point. Maybe they don't know what my priorities are. Is getting shot down by an idiot with no combat experience high on your priority list? The building next to Saturn explodes. Is missing all the time high on your priority list? You really are a brat. Is getting harassed constantly by flirtatious brats high on your priority list? You're really on your toes today. I can't hit you with anything. Yeah, I'm having fun too. What a mess. <laughs> I don't know why I'm laughing about it or having so much fun. I'm glad you think so. It's a funny kind of date, if you put it that way. If this fighting is just play fighting, then keep playing with me. You should be careful though. You never know what I might try next. I've got so many plans for dragging you out in the sun. Like what? Are they working on me? Of course. Stop underestimating me. I'm executing several plans as we speak. You're not at all ready, Terra. I'm not giving you any way out. You're not going to at least give me a hint? I'm at a disadvantage here. You can't trick me into giving it all away. But maybe you're right. Maybe I should be generous and let you know just a hit. Just a hint. About one plan. You're generous. You should know this, but winning isn't my highest priority. It won't mean that I'm easy, though. Hey, we do think alike. At least on the first half of that. If you love winning, the stalemate of this whole conflict should bore you to tears. All that's left in space are second choice pilots who suck at things like winning, no matter how good they are. I'm the second choice. But I'm the pilot that's here right now, and no one else would have thought of the plan I did. Oh? I'm a second choice too, or I wouldn't be here. It's that great a plan? Really? You? Oh, it's not a good plan. It's just that no one else would do it, because I'd have to be a freak to try to catch you on foot. A first choice would never be sent to space in the first place. That does sound like a crazy plan to me. What would you even do if you found me, assuming I'm standing still? I know it sounds like I'm showing off, but I couldn't beat you in a fair fight, so anything else is in my favor, right? Maybe it's the only way around that ghost ship of yours and how much of a genius you are. I can track any ship that I've hit once. I also have ways of being so hidden you could never find me. You're right, ha. <laughs> but you haven't used them. Maybe not. Also, did you know that your Mayor Chrissium has a manual bypass for opening the cockpit? Yes. Oh good, but I'll knock anyway. The gentle hiss of pressure, and the cockpit opens. Hi. You look a little different, not nearly so smug. And you look a lot different. I remember you now. You were such a good girl. I never would have thought that was you. You're smiling, Lunaterra. Did something good just happen? You must really trust me to come unarmed. Why would I need to be? I win. I'd say I'm pretty dangerous just like this. You think of everything. Never mind. You do look infuriatingly smug for someone I just beat. Step away from the controls. Sure, sure. I'm not laughing at you. I'm impressed. You know, even still, even in a fake fight, you have no respect for. No one takes me this seriously. I'm the Memorial Foundation Ace, but just by default. 
after the good ones left. So I don't mind losing to you, since you think I'm so cool. Lunaterra kneels by the controls, hands up. They're still in reach. Saturn climbs the open hatch. No sudden movements, and I don't think you're cool. What do you want now? My ship? Me? They're both useless. I'll decide that. I don't need your ship out of commission. I'm going to be much cooler than you very soon, and then I'll beat you sort of fair and square. But maybe I should reprogram this ship to be absolutely sure. Lunaterra whips around so fast, aren't Lunaterra whips her around so fast, Saturn's pinned down in the cockpit seat before she can tell how it happened. Sorry, but touching there isn't allowed. Hmm. So, then where is touching allowed? You are absolutely much more dangerous without a gun. LT's hand is on Saturn's collar, and her other on Saturn's wrist. Saturn slips her free hand down LT's arm. So how about here? That's fine. What about here? I won't stop you. You don't mind if I touch your face, but you won't let me touch your ship? Some places on the ship are fine. Some places on me are fine. Which do you want to know right now? Is this? Damn it. So how's unbuttoning my shirt going? It's harder than it looks at that angle, with just one hand, huh? Just make out with me, you heinous bitch. Lunaterra had this idea, but instead she forgets it. She finds she's let her grip go slack, and Saturn's nearly leapt out of her chair, leapt out of the chair to kiss her. That thought is a little surprising, but her body made the right call in the moments in between when she was too busy overthinking it. Saturn seems a little mad about that smug face Lunaterra is making, and bites Lunaterra's lip as they kiss. It doesn't encourage Lunaterra to stop being like that. This is absolutely insane. Are you kidding? What could possibly be a better use of your time? Don't tell me Judy is why you're fighting out here or you would have stopped me before I opened this hatch. You're not just here for fun. You're not just doing this because there's no point. And you're not killing time before the war collapses one way or another. Obviously. I can be sure and still make out with you. Would it disappoint you if I wasn't? Sorry. I saw like part of that. Would it disappoint you if I wasn't? Oh, don't make that face, I can tell it would. That's good though. I feel the same way. I wouldn't have let you flirt if that's just all you were. How can you be so sure? Looks like I know something you don't. Even if it's just one thing. I'm always the last to know. You always make it seem like you know what you're doing. I'm just acting on instinct. My body knows what to do. Then you should be asking her. She'll know just what to do. I feel like that scene needs a moment to breathe. That's what we get at this point when we're 50% in with that faction. I wonder what 100% is going to look like. Though I have a feeling I'll have to choose between the uh, Cradle's Graces and Celestial Mechanics and I'm pretty sure I'm going to feel it makes more sense to go with Pluto, unfortunately. But we'll see because I, did, I didn't go with them the first time and I really should have. September 12th, 1963. That's when the first and last artificial colony of the native sphere was completed in a tranquil bowl of stable gravity at Lagrange Point 5. As the front line against existential threats, a training facility for a generation of humans adapted to fight in space. As a colony environment with the life, gravity, and culture necessary for human beings to live, thrive, die, and be born. 
with the hope that peace on earth would reign if we won this war in heaven. Without pressure, water boils off our tongues, and we dissolve into component parts. Without culture, we forget the shapes we're supposed to have, and turn inside out into something else. Out of necessity, we created a pressurized environment, exerting enough gravitational exerting enough gravitational pressure to maintain cohesion, all senses, in space, a ship self to ferry us through the world. They function only in places where the gravity of humans is too light to sustain existence. It was doomed from the start. Of course they were jealous. Of course the humans on it. Of course of the humans the Earth no longer wanted, flying on zero G wings. Dr. Nix, Executive Director, Memorial Foundation Existence Expansion. This puts an interesting light on some of the stuff we've been talking about. The colony was made with capital C culture as a necessity. But without pressure, water boils out our tongues, without culture, we forget the shapes we're supposed to have and turn inside out into something else. So. I'm just reading that as like a heteronormative capitalist society enforcing roles upon people that they may not be happy with, may not want, etc, etc. So Earth effectively wanted to replicate Earth in space. Obviously literally not possible. Not the same environment, not the same world, not the same society. But they still thought they could. They thought they could imbue a culture that would enforce the same kind of structure and then that didn't work and they were just like shit shit I'm sorry I'm trying to delete it and out of necessity they made ship selves as the ways in which a person like person can go through space by being in like a single person piloted device but the ship selves are probably one of the biggest ways in which culture their intended culture can be undermined because it is such an alien experience and it's also tied to the idea of their identities the projected body of a person being distinct This is interesting. I'm. I wonder how I'll read things when I, when I go back from the start again and I know all of this stuff. <laughs> July 29th, nineteen fifty-eight. That's when the Memorial Foundation International Executive Committee was granted international authority in the spirit of unified human peace and the verified presence of an existential threat outside of the solar system to establish a cultural, military, and scientific response to existential threats. No longer confined to Earth, a growing native sphere where our gravity reigns forever. Safety, research, and expansion. The three pillars of Memorial's Foundation's space branch will protect Earth from without as it has from within. Free from the old world's gravity, it would be possible to advance science, art, and culture without constraint and join hands. All of Earth, finally unified. For Memorial Foundation, protecting humans from other humans through peace on Earth and protecting humans from everything else through war in Heaven would fulfill both of our agendas simultaneously. We really, foolishly, decided we could do better. There are two errors to this approach. The first is that to do better in Heaven is meaningless if it cannot be exported to Earth. The space program was never rejected by the surface. It simply did not have enough relevance to sustain interest. The second error is the intrinsic error of Memorial Foundation. The existential threat is intrinsic to humanity. You can fight it, but you cannot cut it out. The designation of alien is required by humans. We cannot trick an existential threat into a convenient manifestation, as it has always, as it has always been. Only humans can fulfill the criteria to be alien. Your, oh, this is Europa. Well, <laughs> didn't read it. Europa's voice. Chief Officer, Memorial Foundation Existential Safety. So this is another way of looking at the existential threat that I had thought about a little bit, but this is really 
uh, underlined it. The existential threat is like the just the general concept of the other, the way in which like in groups and out groups conflicts are fought over the idea that uh, nations can kind of divide and then say we're against them and you, you should be with us because you're in our side and then the existential threat and I do think this still fits with the idea that it's being invented if you make up a fake other to unite humanity in theory you can say that well humanity is no longer no longer has any need to fight because we actually have this other thing that's outside of us that's not real that's not real so you'll never actually have to fight fight but it will mean you put down all your petty fights your infighting can stop because the thing you're actually against is something way off over there and it's not actually real and it's in another place which is the first time at which I could say that maybe the Memorial Foundation is doing something I would care about but it also still seems like f fake is the wrong word but it seems fruitless I don't believe in it still I don't think this works especially when unity is, unity is not necessarily a good concept unity through conformity is uh, not ideal especially when you're going to have people you sent to space to be soldiers but you still expect them to just be earthlings and nothing else when fighting your fake proxy war that is probably not sufficient to actually end conflict the other thing i forgot to mention when reading the last letter is heaven has now been name checked so the title of the game is put in the context of just heaven is space which i mean is surely not hard to grasp but now that i'm actually thinking about it it's a little bit clearer on oh heaven will be mine is about wanting space and uh, more specifically thematically about being able to actualize and get the kind of being able to get away from earth and the oppressive culture earth is projecting and instead just be able to be your cool robot ship self out in space with your other gay robot ship self girlfriend which yeah sounds pretty good january 2nd 1980 that's when they blew up the lagrange colony it was a real shame it was a green, wet, and very peaceful place, and now it's a very cold, green, wet, and very unsettling place. It's where we did a lot of legitimately incredible things, like create sustainable tidal reactors, new culture, experiment with human bodies and human development, um, big question marks there, manufacture self-sufficient alter egos for, sa for space exploration, big question marks there and did everything other than successfully combat the unknowable existential threat. Earth and the Memorial Foundation surface considers that a failure, but in truth, they're just not trying hard enough. Earth, through gravity, humans decide what is real and what is not. Humans cannot make whatever they imagine come true. Through imagining, humans chart out what is true. They invent, with human effort, what exists. If an existential threat doesn't exist, we just have to make one. But of course it doesn't work like that. Nothing could be more difficult than creating something alien. Our only reference points are human, so the idea of something alien is unimaginable, because we cannot imagine outside of those terms. There's a certain degree of misunderstanding needed for humans to successfully classify something as alien. But before, we blew it, before they blew it up, we got very close. Iapetus, Executive Director, Memorial Foundation Existential Research. Sorry, I love the energy of the opening paragraph being, we had one job and we did really good at everything but that. So, experimenting with human bodies, bad, big problems with that. Not surprised. Honestly, sounds like 
probably at least one of our player characters has gone through something along those lines. Experimenting can mean something as can mean psychological or could mean like training in ways that are somewhat experimental, but also could mean like literally uh, biologically or mechanically tinkering with bodies. Given what the ship selves are, I feel like that's also at least allegorically happening. But the part that's manufacturing self-sufficient alter egos for space exploration. Are they talking about making not pe I mean well if this comes up later we'll we'll talk this through then, but not making people so much as they are making autonomous like robots or robot adjacent things. So just making pilots. I guess yeah, that's probably the best way to put it. Making pilots that can run ship selves, the ship selves that can be self-sufficient. Or is that meant to mean the ship self that then pilots collaborate with? There's not been, to, to my eye, much of an implication that the ships themselves are alive, so much as they're an extension of the pilots, but there is a little bit that could be read that way. So, I wonder if that's where it's going. But also, yes, through gravity, human, humans deal, decide what is real and what is not. Humans cannot make whatever they imagine come true. I'm gonna underline that three times and then draw an arrow back to what I was talking about with culture and imposing a culture and the idea that people on Earth thought they could just decide the culture and that did, did not work out. And likewise, the existential threat further underscoring the idea that it's manufactured or was attempted to be, they wanted to make a fake alien. We got very close is interesting. I would like to know what that means. Day five. Receiving report. Provisional acceptance of pilot mission completion. Incoming alert, all Memorial Foundation troops. Abandon Ares frontline. All units immediately rendezvous with main fleet at the Pilot Academy Lagrange Colony, on the way to Celestial Mechanics Moon Base. Generating new assignments. Provisional assignment, Special Operations Mission. Secure Lagrange Colony as possible launch point for Celestial Mechanics hit and run, for Celestial Mechanics hit and run tactics. Provisional assignment, Special Operations Mission. Destruction of obsolete Academy research technology before it falls into the hands of Cradle's Graces. Provisional assignments will reduce your penalty status. Indicate you've ad you have understood new orders. Why? Ready for gravitational catapult. Prepare a launch to Lagrange Point 5. Uh, yep, Celestial Mechanics getting big and weighty on this map. And yeah, we got two more... Two more missions, some mail alerts, some comms to work through. So first, let's look at our mail and alerts, then our comms, and then we'll look at picking a mission. Probably again, just alternating. Subject. Secular Astrology Explained, Part 2. We, oh, we did get a part one. Oh, so this is from Mars again. This is, like, laying out themes and such. Or at least a certain reading of it. Origin. Achieved Message Retrieval. Author. Pilot Mars. I only did this because you asked, okay? I warned you, this is dorky stuff. The ancient roots of it are pretty dubious, in case you were wondering. I think most of it is just made up. I mean, yes, I know that it's all made up. But not even made up by some wise man a thousand years ago. It's made up by some dude in California. Anyways, what's the dude from California? What the? Anyways, what the dude from California does is he organizes the parts of the body into the parts of the mind and the spirit. And he says that what you should do is think about your body not as a body, but as a tool for relating to other people. I know that they draw them on a body, but it's like, don't think of them as actual body parts. It's the way you communicate. So this chart might help? I think the point of it, in a way, is to remember that these are all parts of you, but also parts of other people. And you have ways of communication between each other using them. People always ask me for their charts because they want to be flattered by what they're good at. But that's not the point. 
you need to know where you have trouble, too. I looked at mine so much right before we broke up, you know. Like it did any good. But you know, I'm so weak when it comes to Venus. That's the distance of breath. Which means ability to read the atmosphere and talking. The way we communi- I think that should be we. The way we communicate through breath. When you're bad at Venus, that doesn't mean you're bad with words, but you're bad at receiving words. You don't hear them. Or you don't feed other people the words they need to live. Well, according to your chart, you're bad at that too, so I hope it helps. What's funny is most of these don't seem to actually be addressed remotely to... I mean, a lot of these don't even seem to be addressed to people, but this one seems actually be addressed to a person, not necessarily Lunaterra. The connection to Venus is interesting for anyone who has played Heaven Will Be, who's played We Know the Devil too, uh, because of a character from that. Um, there was something else. Yeah, this again talking a lot about the body and how a body is not. <laughs> You should think of your body not as a body, but as a tool for relating to other people. Which is funny to me because it obviously ties into the whole ship self kind of reading of them as not strictly speaking. Them being a somehow an extension of their bodies or like an alternative body. But I mean, this this line just kind of further underscores the idea of like, you can't think, don't think of yourself as having a canonical body. Your body is... A tool to relate to other people. So, why would a ship self be any different? Why would a car be any different? A car is a tool through which you will relate to other people on a road, in the same way that a ship self is how you will navigate space. But at that point, if you're interacting with other people, it's through your ship self. It's not through your, like, actual hands. It's not even through your mouth and ears because you're using comm systems. It's all mediated through the ship selves you're using at that point and then inevitably those ship selves are representative and have expressive of both your character but then also obviously your character is being presented through the lens of the ship self you're using to communicate if you try to tell someone if you're in say a ship self that has a thousand missiles just hanging out on it. You don't might not be aiming them, you might not be doing anything at all with them. But if you're hanging out in one of those and telling someone to calm down and just turn off their laser rifle or whatever, that says something different than if you're just in like a little worker mech ship self style thing that's just got no weapons. It's just a pair of arms and legs and you're telling someone to calm down. The communication you're having is different because those are different bodies and those express different things and have different implied communication. Anyway. Again, this continues to be interesting stuff to kind of underline parts of the reading. Next we'll hear about how they meet some more. Subject, Pilot Halimede Annual Report. Origin, Second Generation Pilot Program. Declassified. Okay, so I mean, here's an explicit acknowledgement that there were multiple generations of pilots. I'm guessing, so Halimede was from the second generation. I think, it seems like Lunaterra was from before this generation, if I'm understanding correctly. Author, Pilot Assessment Reports. Dr. Nix. She's not coming out of her room, refuses to pilot it. Figures the most well-behaved of all Generation 2 pilots would have a tantrum like a storm when it finally came. You expect me to know what to do about it? The zero book, by the way. Yes. It's really your problem, though, isn't it? Don't start. I am begging. Fine, fine. What's the big problem then? She'll get over it. Is she upset about her sister? Of course she is, but 
not for the reason I thought. What did you think? That she missed her. Hilarious. And what's the actual reason? She won't accept a hand-me-down. The low sulci? Sulci? I... Huh. That's a funny name. I, I've only just now realized I've never really tried to read into the names very much. I've never tried to check if they relate to anything real. I've just thought the name sounded cool and moved on. Uh, I should probably... I'll, I'll check on those probably for next time. The low sulci? She won't pilot it? She won't pilot the perfect second generation machine because it was made for her sister. She wants her own machine made. She's ridiculous. She said it would be fine if she died, but if it's just because she flaked out and got bored with space and left her problem in Hallie Mead's lap, she won't do it. Are siblings really this petty and mean? Stop laughing and help. More family drama than I thought going on here. Halamid is definitely being coded as very being uh, represented so far as extremely like childish, immature, and I think the implication even being very powerful and having very specific powers, like Europa and her sister have both had similar powers, but there's something about how Halamids have manifested that makes her special in a way that's made her coddled perhaps or at least that's kind of i feel like that's the implied thing happening but it's hard to say because i mean it, it certainly sounds like they're basically saying look we need to do anything we can to get this child to get it in their mech okay that for some more comes with europa do we get along better or worse than back then Let's talk about something else. Oh, is it really so bad these days? We don't get along because we're too much like each other. We used to be so different. What happened? I got older and learned a lot. That's enough to make me more like you. You're not giving me enough credit. Really? Do you think I'd blame you for being too good at teaching me the same lessons that made you who you are? Well, I'd always hoped. I'd blame you if I felt like it. There's nothing to blame you for. Nothing you warned me about turned out like you said, so I stopped paying attention to any of your advice. I thought I was too smart for the rest. So it's just a coincidence we ended up like each other. I never minded your lessons. Are you sure? I was a really harsh teacher. Are you glad for it? I am happy for everything I learned. Not for everything you taught me. I mean, it wasn't like you were wrong. Everything you said would happen, happened. But none of it happened like you said it would. If I followed your advice to the letter, it wouldn't have helped me at all. It was all just different enough. So I came up with my own answers. It wasn't until I looked back on them that I realized it was exactly what you would have done. Fair, I suppose. I shouldn't count that as success for me. But also, due to your effort, for you. That's just what I wanted, though. I certainly never wanted a carbon copy of myself. I wanted you to improve on what you'd been handed. Did you think you did a good job? Shouldn't you be the one asking that question, since you're the one in charge of the education? I was afraid you'd say that. Don't come to me for answers now of all times. Haha, <laughs> well... At least there's plenty of time for me to turn out right in the end. Channel closed. You're the one in charge of the education. So then... 
this is three ways to me that this line makes sense. Either just Lunatari should be at this point educating herself at the experience level she's at. Probably not that. That feels like too basic. Is Lunatari meant to be the new coach? Is she meant to be like Europa's replacement to effectively take over teaching the next generation of pilots? Or is there someone specific Lunatera is supposed to be educating, perhaps specifically Halamid, who is notably difficult and difficult in heavy quotes, just meaning she doesn't do what she's told. Is that part of why they're willing to put up with Lunatera's own kind of bratty behavior? It's different with Lunatera because she's so, like, cool and disaffected about things. But she is also just doing what she wants and kind of disregarding orders regularly. I mean, uh, just look at the alignment chart. I've betrayed several times. Though, uh, just before we move on, I'll remember, while I'm here, I'll remember I realized the math I did the first time was correct and my revised math was just wrong for reasons I realized. You will only get four chances to betray to ally with the enemy factions, but eight to ally with your own faction, which means there are going to be eight days because obviously that's how you can get to 100%. It occurred to me basically when I was like, oh, it's 12% because if you did it eight times, then you get to 100, blah, blah, blah. So we're basically past the halfway point ish depending on how the ending exactly works all right so we've got our two missions um neither of these tell you who's on the mission which is interesting unlike the previous few so look at me the cold war is long over and the existential threat is gone but its memories will still stir here at the observatory. Will it be put to rest here or buried forever? Huh. Those things don't feel as different as uh, I assumed the options were going to be. Deeper cuts in the garden district closest to the malfunctioning and broken tidal reactor that kept the colony together. Time and space aren't quite right. It's the perfect place for a real fight. How deep under Lunatara's skin do you think she can get? I guess I'm going to go with the first one because I'm very interested in the existential threat and kind of... Right, did they say... Yeah, threat. For a second I was like, they didn't say terror in this case, did they? Because that's very different. You're too quiet, Europa. What's up? Is that unusual? Sometimes. But you said I have a briefing for you five minutes ago. Ah, it seems I lost track of time again. But don't you already know what the mission is? Also, this background's so good. Close the lens and prevent Cradle's graces from opening it further. For the purpose of? Who knows? Memorial Foundation on the ground wants it done. It was the observation device for existential threats. But in the end, we never knew if what we were seeing was what there was, or if we, the observers, were just seeing what we wanted to see. When it became clear that celestial mechanics had been pushing development in the direction of things that they did not themselves understand, we chose to destroy the colony. Overreaction? Maybe? Later works of the space colony era. Uh, later works of the space colony era simply show, showed signs of an art and design movement potentially hazardous and implicitly treacherous to the human race. I think I'm going to like the celestial mechanics a lot when I get to there. It, but very lovely. I wish we hadn't caught on so quick. Memorial Foundation on Earth would be loath to admit it but it's possible it did, and does, in fact, work in one or more ways. Casts it in an all new light, doesn't it? I didn't expect you to feel so nostalgic. I have some happy memories of the Academy, don't you? Yes. 
some. But I'd rather move forward in any way at all than keep dwelling. That's always a virtue if you have learned from it. And you're not just trying to forget. Keep your advice to the mission and not me. Well, I only have an interest in the success of one of those two things. <sighs> so, the gate collapses in nostalgia and disaster is the loyal one, and the sort of fight you don't need a robot for is the betrayal option that I'll obviously be taking, because I just don't care about Memorial Foundation's deal. The, observ the observatory's lens, a single eye, staring into space, threatening to blink. From the Academy Gardens, every pilot remembers watching the observatory twitch as it focused on some light years away point, searching. A reminder of the battle for Earth they were eternally preparing for. Not unsettling, but always foreboding. A zero pointed at nowhere. Neither Lunaterra nor Pluto remembers who first called it that. Now in the trembling of the colony's collapsing gravity well, this deck of the wrecked colony where Lunaterra and Pluto met, meet seems like a moment frozen in time, eternally receding, growing always distant, yet never fading. I knew I'd find you here. I knew it would feel like this. But I'm still here. I have orders. <laughs> I know, dummy. They tell me everything, too. You wouldn't have come if you weren't ordered. I don't know why everyone is expecting I'll be bitter about coming back. I'm not. There's good and bad memories. That's fine. That's fair. I'm older now. And it's that much sweeter thinking about the past from here. It's there, and I'm here. I wouldn't go back. Would you? I like being an adult. I don't mind being the aging ace. I don't need to be a glittering hero. We fought so hard against the existential threat during the Cold War. Whatever they were, trick of the light or not, we did good fighting them. We did good fighting them. We tried our best. That's the practice kids need. Now we're grown up and can see our own futures, and mess them up if we want. I'm way happier to fight now. Fighting has a different meaning now. No matter how bad I am at being alive, I like it now. You're really grown up now. I kinda hate it. I miss pushing you around and when you'd go along with me. Me too. You still have a hard time making a decision that's good for you all by yourself, though. That's why I asked for orders to come here. <laughs> that's so roundabout. I feel like I'm doing her voice wrong, sorry. <laughs> I feel like it's not distinct enough. That's so roundabout. I can't tell if that's a step forward or back. I think it would be worse if anyone else shut the observation gate. So I thought it really would have to be me. A zero pointed nowhere. Do you remember who said that? It's better than the actual name. I don't remember who said it, but I always think of it. I don't remember either. Do we have to do this? You're the one who's here to do it. It could be really easy. You're the one forcing my hand. Closing it is just a formality. It already is broken. And it never worked in the first place. Then why were you ordered to do it? The fact that you're here means I have to be here. 
They want any possibility closed, every possibility closed. That's not harmony. These futures should get to live, even if they never come to pass. If trying to make worlds in space is naive, cutting the native sphere off from the universe is just as naive. It's so pathetic and sad. It's even more pointless and sad than human beings fighting each other for no reason. I can't bear it. I won't let it happen. I changed my mind. Let's fight. I'd rather fight than keep talking like this. We're fighting now. This is, this is the sort of fight ship selves were made for. This is a very interesting conflict. Uh, I do... I, I don't like to interrupt the conversation flow, but I do want to go back to something Lunatero was saying. And I feel like I'm going to lose the thread if I don't do it now. Where Lunatera... Lunatera was saying that in the end, even if the existential threat was potentially made up, we were still good. It was still good that we fought them. That's the kind of thing we should do. I'm kind of curious. I, I really hope we get a little bit more of Lunaterra's ace pilot past. Like more digging into that. I doubt we're gonna get any kind of flashback, but maybe some of the emails will, stuff like that will continue to kind of clarify it. Because it's so funny that she's so jaded, but clearly had much stronger feelings mm. presumably had much stronger feelings about this their whole deal in the past like presumably to be the ace pilot to begin with to become this kind of figure you have to have believed in it at one point whereas it's kind of more that she's tired now and has lingering beliefs but is not in both sidesy, but she's a lot more like understanding of the different viewpoints, and on that basis is a lot less has a lot less conviction. Pluto seems like a lot more. I have <laughs> Pluto seems a lot more. I've literally just found ideology, and I am sticking with it one hundred percent. And that's not to say I disagree with Pluto very much, but that is to say. Pluto's just so much more gung-ho, and, like, I mean, this conversation started with uh, with Pluto trying to assert her ideology at Lunaterra, and Lunaterra was like, can we just fight instead? Do we have to do this part? Which I think just speaks to the amount of dedication each of them has to the actual factions they're with. Again, I've obviously only been loyal once in this game so far. I don't know if that's feeding into this characterization of Lunaterra or if this is just what she's like. I'm assuming it's more the latter because I was already getting these vibes even when I was loyal on that first day. Oh, also this line, yeah, this is the other reason I stopped. Pluto talking about their fighting just by kind of discussing their ideologies back and forth and this is the sort of fight ship cells were made for. That's an interesting line. I don't have a lot to unpack from it. I'm going to be curious about it over time, but like... <laughs> is the assertion that ship selves were made for ideological conflict? Or communication? Or both? Because, I mean, the same thing. Because before, ship selves have been described as being necessary as, for people as individuals to be able to traverse space, which heavy with metaphor right there, but they've often not actually been focused on as vehicles for combat so much before. That's clearly what they've been used for because that's just what's erupted in space and also the existential threat is obviously a threat that they've seen as an enemy to fight. But honestly, the ship selves have not been focused on their combat powers. Like, combat has not seemed like uh, the main point of agenda for the ship selves. It's almost seemed like 
Yes, they will fight. Yes, we have made them capable of fighting, but no one talks about it very much. It comes up in the fight scenes, because obviously that's how you narrate a fight scene. But people discuss ship selves way more in terms of being ref like people discuss the kind of body or identity aspect of ship selves so much more than it's got the sick sword or cool gun. Say something. I can't, I have nothing. Let's fight like we're supposed to. I won't. Don't make me talk. Don't make me fight with you. Don't make me kill your dream. Stop having this dream. Give up on space like the rest of the human race has. Let me close the iris of the observatory. It's because I wanted so much to see what that eye was supposed to see. That I can't let you keep looking. That I can't keep looking. That I don't want us to be tortured by that possibility anymore. That we can't lose you. I can feel how scared you are. And how brave. And how much you love. But I'm so mad at you. Why can't you believe like you did before? Mm -hmm. Jaded. <laughs> they brought us here with good intentions. And did everything they could. They really did. They really thought we could be better than who we were. The best kind of human beings there could be. They worked us very hard, but they fought for us to be exactly what we wanted to be. Because that was human too. Even when it was hard, or didn't make sense, they found a way. Even the awful ones really believed. One humanity, every story threaded together. No one left behind. It would be really possible to fix the universe and let humans live forever in space. Childish dreams that everyone wishes could be true. All without understanding such simple things. I wonder how they expected they could unite humanity against aliens when they found us so alien. We will always be our own existential threat. Every human understood that but them. No wonder Earth rejected us. The observation deck sees nothing because the threat is on the other side. We are each each other. We are each other's alien. Again, I need to pause there because that's a lot of. The new thing there is, it is surprising to me, but I guess it makes sense if you can side with them, that the Memorial Foundation, as far as Luna Terra tells it, was sincere. <laughs> I'm reading, I was reading their stuff very skeptically, and they're like, mm, yeah, they just wanted to perpetuate their own existence, but in space. Luna Terra is characterizing it slightly more sincere in that they wanted people to thrive in space. They legitimately did want things to go well and to support the people of space. But the problem was that they wanted to keep people in space only in the way that made sense to them. As soon as they were othering people in space because they couldn't understand the people of space, everything falls apart. And that's... Greed's is almost inevitable because they had the wrong mindset from the jump. So. This isn't changing my mind about the Memorial Foundation, but it's interesting to think of them as more sincere and less... I don't know, like, less aware of what they were even doing. Like, they couldn't understand people in space is why the problems came up. It's not even, like, a calculated oppression. It's just a completely unable to understand kind of thing. It was flawed and it wasn't real. But they weren't stupid. You know they weren't. The whole point was that it wasn't real yet, and it could be. That's what they wanted to do. They wanted to make it real. And now they don't anymore. Do you? I mean, really, do you want to go home too? Why can't you just say yes? I wouldn't mind if you actually wanted it. I'd go with you if you wanted it. But I'm not coming with you if you don't. I'll still fight. Thank you. I'm hoping that you win. Even if you can't, I will promise this. I won't bring us back to Earth empty-handed. I'll do that if I die. 
The iris shifts. It still moves somehow, attuned to possibility. Mare Chrissium is looking fit to kill if it wasn't trembling. This colony is a place of unsteady gravity. You're not on sure footing here. I'm back to being helpless again like I used to be. You can stop me at any time. Prove you're ready to close this eye. I can't. I can't. I don't accept it, but that doesn't mean I won't do it. I don't care if you'll love me one way or the other. It's too much. Space is broken, but I don't want to leave. Earth is terrifying, but I can't go back there alone. I have no loyalty either way. I'm not strong like you. I just go where gravity takes me. You can hold everyone, but what do I do if I lose you? Your heart is full of everyone, but I can't watch you fight for the universe, knowing how little you're thinking of yourself in it. Of course I don't know what to do, when fighting for you and fighting for your dream are such different things. There's too much to do. Of course I don't know what to do. I don't know what you want me to do. Luna. God. I can't remember the last time you cried. Oh no. I can. It was when you said you hated it here in space, and I told you you should go back and I'll come with you. Those were such hard days, and you didn't want to keep fighting. But when I said that, you started crying and crying, and I couldn't understand why. It seemed so simple a solution, and everything you wanted. And I got mad. I got so mad. Then you told me you didn't want to leave if it meant me giving anything up. You didn't want to give anyone else up either. I wasn't expecting it at all. I'm so used to knowing what's on your mind, what's on everyone's mind. I didn't think you could keep something so locked away and hidden. No matter how far my tides reach, there's some places I can't ever know until you tell me. It was the first time I felt frustrated by that. I'm most angry at you when I can't do what you want, but I guess that's how you feel about me. And how I feel about you. Oh baby, you're crying again. I can't let you win, but we'll be together until the end, and after. Day 6. Alright, we're here 50%, 50%. This should technically be 75, I really should never have sided with the Memorial Foundation, but you can't escape the sins of the past. I think that's going to do it for this episode. I'll, I'll try to remember to look up if there's any kind of words or f phrases, concepts. I should know based on the names of the mechs. I'll try to look into that for next time and bring it up at the start if I do have anything of value to say. Thank you all for watching this, and again, as I say, if you're enjoying the game, please do support the creators, Pillow Fight Games. They've made this as well as multiple other games of similar styles. You can check out the links in the description to go buy those. That's all for this episode, though. Thank you for watching.